Miracy. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm so proud to produce the four, soon to be five, podcasts in the Miracy FM Podcast Network. Since we're closed for the holiday season, I thought it would be fun if the behind the scenes podcast crew each chose a favorite episode to air during this time. And then Danny, our executive producer, who's always raising the bar on value, said, why don't you each record an intro telling our listeners why you've made that choice? So we bought our Blue Yeti microphones and carefully wrote our scripts and practiced a bunch, you can be sure. So don't miss Jeff's moving, making it selection on New Year's Eve and Mishi's spirited choice for Just Between Coaches on December 29th. For Course Lab, which doesn't air again until January, but then goes weekly, you heard that here first, I chose Diane Southard's episode about her course on making sense of your DNA testing. I chose this for a couple of reasons. First, it was the episode that set the bar for our guests. As Danny says in the episode, it has an optimal amount of story and detail, and you can hear Diane's passion around the block. All of our guests know their stuff. They're experts in their fields, but Diane takes credibility to the nth degree. You have to hear her tell the story herself, but suffice to say, her work on a college DNA project helped lay the foundation for that billion-dollar industry. That's worth the second listen, don't you think? And so when you think of genetic genealogy databases today, you might be familiar with 23andMe or Ancestry DNA or MyHeritage. All of that started with this little college project that I was a part of that really exploded into the industry we know today. Hello and welcome to Course Lab, the show that teaches course creators like you how to make better online courses. I'm Danny Eney, founder and CEO here at Miracy, and I'm with my co-host Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. In each episode, we showcase a course and course creator who is doing something really interesting with their course. Our guest today is Diane Souther. She is a microbiologist and author who teaches people how to make sense of their DNA testing. Diane, welcome to Course Lab. Thank you so much, Danny and Abe, for having me. I am just thrilled to be here. Well, we are thrilled to have you here. And give us kind of the 30,000 feet view of just who are you? What do you do? How did you come to be doing this? Well, you can actually trace my origin to my high school English teacher, actually. So if any of you out there are teaching high schoolers, there's a chance you could have an incredible impact on someone just with a simple phrase. So one thing our high school English teacher encouraged all of us to do is he said, as soon as you get to college, find a professor who's researching something you're interested in and get involved. And that one piece of advice has completely changed the course of my entire life. So I took his advice and I got to college. I want to do something with DNA and genetics. And I went to Brigham Young University. So I went to the biology department and I asked the secretary there for a list of of topics. Like every professor has to research and publish. And so she had a list and I looked down the list and it was like virology. And I was like, boring, bacteria, boring. And then there was Dr. Scott Woodward who was doing archaeogenetics. And I was like, what is this? So I walked down the hall, I knock on his door and he was like, well, we have this cemetery right outside of Cairo, Egypt, but the cemetery is not attached to any town. And we're trying to use DNA and other evidence to try to figure out who these people are. And I was like, um, yeah, I want to do that. And so I just started volunteering in the lab. And honestly, that project turned into the first genetic genealogy database. And so when you think of genetic genealogy databases today, you might be familiar with 23andMe or Ancestry DNA or MyHeritage. All of that started with this little college project that I was a part of that really exploded into the industry we know today. That was so cool. So how did that bring you to where you are now teaching a course called Your DNA Guide? Basically, when people ask that, I say, mm, divine intervention. Like for me, like there is no other way I could have ended up here. It really started 
with priorities that I had in my life. Um, so I, right after college, I started working for what had then become a foundation that was starting this genetic genealogy database. The foundation turned into a company. And right about the same time, I started my family. I started having babies and they were very um, flexible. And they said, hey, you still want to work for us in some capacity while you're having your kids? Great. And they just worked with me. And then it got to the point where they were sold actually to Ancestry DNA. So the project I was working on for all of those years became the foundation of the product that Ancestry DNA now offers. And at that point, it was like, well, I can either work full time for Ancestry DNA or do something else. And I, I just didn't want to work full time. I wanted to be a full time mom and do this on the side. And so I just made the decision that was more important to me was to stay home with my kids and I had a couple of other colleagues who kind of had other opportunities and we just kind of cobbled something together for a while and eventually I, they got real jobs <laughs> and it was just me. And so I became your DNA guide, a DNA education company working with any DNA test that anybody has taken across any platform and helping them use it to understand their family history. So someone has already taken a DNA test of some kind, and then they come to you? Or do they also take your course in preparation for taking their DNA test? Well, the current course that I'm offering is only for people that have had a DNA test taken. But of course, I've got millions of ideas for more courses. And one of them will be kind of a foundational course to help people understand what testing options are out there. But for now, we have an incredible blog on my website that gives you all of those kinds of pointers. One of our most popular blog posts is, what DNA test should I take? And we kind of take you through the options that are out there and help you decide what might be best for you if you haven't yet taken a DNA test. Okay, cool. So tell us about your current course, your DNA guide. When did you first build it? What inspired you to do it? What is what does it look like? You know, if somebody signs up and says, I'm in, what is their experience? Tell us all about it. Um, before March of 2020, I was very busy on the lecture circuit. So people, um, genealogy societies. So these are whole societies of people that are gathered together with the purpose of learning how to find their family more effectively. And of course, DNA is now a huge part of that. And so I was really busy traveling two or three weekends a month, uh, going to different states, even internationally, to conferences and teaching and lecturing. And that was a huge part of my income. I released a book in um, March of 2020 also that is a step-by-step -step book teaching you how to do this, find your ancestor using your DNA. So things were like going really well. And I was envisioning 2020 to be a year of these book sales because you show up in person and you lecture and you get paid for that. But it's really the sales side that was making money as far as keeping my business alive. And so I had ordered in anticipation of all of these conferences I was attending, lots of books. And I was self-publishing. So when the pandemic hit and all of those speaking engagements were canceled, and now I'm sitting on this big pile of books, and I was like, what am I going to do? And so I had already thought of doing online courses, uh, but I hadn't, you know, made the time most likely to do it. And so I started, you know, scouring YouTube because that's what we all do now when we want to learn how to do something new. I was trying to make things way too complicated and it doesn't need to be complicated because I just, I do, I overcomplicate. I am very creative and I want everything to be amazing and fantastic and I want to have all the bells and whistles and that's just not what I needed. And so that was in May of 2020. And so I took um, the Course Builders Workshop through the summer and by August I was ready for my pilot and um, I have a mailing list, which is a huge asset. I learned that I actually have a lot of assets that help me already kind of be totally poised to have a wonderful experience in launching a workshop, an online workshop. And so I just basically put it out to my mailing list with a pilot pricing and we had 25 spots open and we sold out in four hours. That's amazing. And what did you charge for those pilot spots? I charged four ninety seven dollars for the pilot. And I had a lot of people tell me that that wasn't enough. Like, obviously, selling out in four hours was, was not. 
It was a good sign. Um, our, our course now, so it's called the DNA Skills Workshop is what we're calling it now. And it's um, $9.97 is the price now of the full workshop. So we ran the pilot. We actually did the pilot twice. I tweaked some things the second time and learned a lot both times. And then uh, we launched the full workshop in January 2021 with 50 people. And we almost filled it. And then in March, we did it again and had um, sold 48 spots of the 50. That's amazing. What were the numbers on the second pilot? 25. And we we sold out that easily. It wasn't in four hours, but it was in like two or three days. Cool. Also at 497. Also at 497. And we weren't doing any real marketing campaigns. Like the first time even, we did a better job. Like the second time, we basically went back to our list and was like, oh, hey, we decided to do this again. Does anybody want to join us? So we didn't do as good of a job selling it the second time, which showed. So we learned a lot that way also, which was really helpful. Um, But yeah, so we sold, I think it was in January, we had like 44, I think. Yeah, 44 in January and then 48 in March. Very cool. And uh, how large is your email list? I'm sure people are going to want to know. So it's grown a ton um, just over the spring. We've done a lot of really great events. So right now we have about 14,000 on our list. But back when we were doing the pilot, it was probably more like 10,000. Very cool. So tell us about the actual course. How does it how does it work? How long is it? What's the experience like? Right. So I again in the spirit of trying to keep things simple, which I just love and it works so much better than complicating everything. Um, so the idea is that it's a 6-week course. And it started out as a five-week course, but we decided we actually needed a a week off in the middle to let people catch up and to give them time to do their own genealogy research in there as well. And so it's really a six-week course with five weeks of instruction. So we, all the videos are pre-recorded and it has lifetime access through Zoku actually. So now you can go to courses.yourdnaguide.com and it looks like my site, but I'm not doing any of the hard work you are. So there's um, five weeks worth of videos and there's probably about between 30 and 50 minutes of video to watch, but they're all broken up into 10 to 12 minute segments. And each video consists of instruction, classwork. So like during the video, I tell them, stop me talking right now and do what I've just asked you to do. So it's either going out to their own DNA results and doing something, or I've given them a workbook and they need to fill out something in their workbook. But it's like, while we're in class together, I'm telling them, pause me and go do this work. So they do that. Rizoku is wonderful. It has a discussion board. So I, I have a prompt in there that lets people ask their questions. And I'm always monitoring that. So they get feedback within a couple of hours, usually from when they post it. What the best thing is, though, is when they post a question and I haven't had a chance to answer and another student comes in and answers. And I love, love, love that. It's so fun to see them helping each other and even going outside the scope of the course. I mean, the course is really just about how to use your DNA, but of course, there's a whole genealogy component to it. Well, how do I find this record? Or have you ever looked for Canadian records? And everybody's so helpful. That's wonderful about the community that I'm a part of. They're just so giving and they love to share with each other. So it's so nice to have that discussion board where they can just kind of share resources back and forth. And, and I can answer their questions right away, which has been very helpful. So they can post on the discussion board and they go through all the courses. And then in their workbook, they have homework. And this is where I feel like the transformation really occurs because you don't know what you've learned until you try to put it into practice and you have an answer because they're going to try to put it into practice in their own family history, but they don't have the answer yet. Like they don't know if they've done it right. And so it's impossible to check. But when I give them a scenario and I give them all the data as if it was real, then they can work the problem and see if they got the right answer. Then they know if they've done it correctly. And this builds confidence. And this is number one, what's lacking in people who want to use DNA to find their family. They just don't feel like they can, you know, like science is such a I don't know. It's a topic that people just automatically put up barriers. Oh, I'm not a scientist. I can't do that. And that's number one, what I'm trying to break down. Our little catchphrase is you can do the DNA. 
And that's what I want to infuse into my students. And it's working. It's so wonderful. And I love it. They post on the discussion board or they'll write in our, we have surveys that we follow up. How did this class go for you? And what could we change? So we're always trying to improve, but they'll say, oh, this was the light bulb moment for me. This is what I really felt like I didn't know how to do before. And I was just missing this little part. And now I'm super confident. And it's so nice. It's so exciting to hear them say, I get it. And I know what to do next in my own family history. It sounds like a real um, kind of active ingredient of making this work is that interactive workbook. Logistically, how does it work? How do you make the workbook interactive? I'm actually in the middle of making another course right now, and it takes so long, and I kind of hate it in a little way because I, I, I'm so careful that when you're making your slides for your course, you have to be making the workbook at the same time because a, a big disconnect that we actually had in the pilot was I used some different images, kind of. I mean, they weren't really different. I didn't feel like they were different in the slide as I did in the workbook. Like, And people were like, wait, that doesn't look exactly the same. And so like to make the page on the workbook look exactly the same as the page they see on the screen was really important. And I learned that really fast to give them page numbers so that they're working right along with you and they know exactly where they are in the workbook. The working the classwork together was really helpful. So again, I'm saying, pause me. And sometimes I'll say, hey, did you really pause me? Don't skip this part. You need to do the classwork, you know? And so you could keep it fun so that people listen. Otherwise, they just watch it all the way through and they think, oh, I don't need to do this right now. And I really want them to understand, no, this is how you learn. We do one small thing and then you practice it. And then we learn and then you do that small thing and you practice it. Because if you just watch it all the way through, you think you get it, but you didn't. And so it's really that interaction between the classwork where you're right there with me and you've just barely done it and then I'm going through it with you again. And it's just that repetition. It's that reinforcement. And again, it's that building confidence. Or if they've done something wrong right there in the classwork, I fix it in the next two minutes. They realize what they've done. And so that corrects it right away before it perpetuates into something more. I mean, it sounds like a a lot of things in the course are working really well uh, right now, which is always great to hear. Uh, Were there things that you learned in the pilot that like didn't work so well or if you had to change or iterate on to get it to where it is today? Yeah, for sure. And one of them was what I'd already learned from Danny was keeping it simple that I kind of ignored. And I was like, no, 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 they want to know this. And I taught it in the pilot. And as I'm teaching it, I'm like, this was ridiculous. They don't need to know this. <laughs> and But it was too late. I was already teaching because I did all the pilots live, right? Which was such a save. Um, as well. Like instead of spending all this time recording, I was just teaching live, which I'm really comfortable with. And, you know, I've done it for years and it's really easy for me. And so it was nice to just get a product out again and start teaching. But in the middle of the class, like I gave them a break. Actually, I remember this. I gave them a break and I called my colleague who was online with me and I was like, what am I doing? They're all so lost. And she's like, no, 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 it's okay. I think if you just kind of go back and, but, but I totally took that out. Like that whole section of things that I taught, I took out. And so that was so valuable to teach it and to realize it was too much for them. Like they didn't need that part of the information at this stage in their learning. But I thought that they did because I felt, you know, all this pressure to give away information and it was too much. So the pilot really helped me refine what was necessary for them to learn at this stage. And the great thing is I've taken all the extra and I'm going to make a second course. And I've already pitched it to all my current DNA skills workshop people. And they're constantly asking me, when are you going to launch that strategies course? I can't wait to take it, you know, because they get the core stuff now and they've had a wonderful experience in the workshop and they're ready for the next one. And so it's exciting. Did you have to go through kind of your own mindset shift and how you approach course design as part of that process? Oh, a hundred percent. (laughs) Yes. Because... I wanted to create a course that was more like my book. So my book is kind of like a choose your own adventure. So you come to the first page of the book with your question. So I want to find my two times great grandparent. And I say, 
fantastic. Turn to page 21. And then on page 21, you're going to go through these steps. I'm going to ask you some questions. And then I'm going to say, do you have situation A? And you say yes. And you go to page 22. If you have situation B, I'm going to send you to page 57. So I wanted the course to just mirror that process. And so people could just essentially do the book through a course. And so it had to be branching. I had to have all of these different scenarios. And that's how I was thinking of building my online course was just to be exactly what the book is. And I quickly found that was really hard to do without an LMS. And LMS is super expensive. And I'm a one-man band. And I can't afford that. And so, and it takes forever (laughs) to build that kind of thing. It took me forever to write the book, let alone like program it into something, you know? And so it took me a while to just figure out that I don't actually need that. I can still create a transformative experience for people without that. And they have the book, like that's part of the course, right? You get the book. And so I don't need to duplicate work I've already done. I can make something companion wise or companionable that goes along with it. Yes. Nice. I mean, this is, this has been a really great walkthrough. I I don't have any burning questions right off the top of my head. Danny, did you? Have anything else? No, I was thinking the same thing. I feel like we we covered so much ground really, really well. Diane, thank you. Diane Southard is a microbiologist and author who teaches people how to make sense of their DNA testing. You can find her at yourdnaguide.com. That's yourdnaguide.com. Now stick around for my favorite part of the show, where Abe and I will pull out the very best insights and practical takeaways for you to take and apply to your own course. So Abe, there's some really cool stuff to, you know, dissect and dive into. What jumped out to you? Well, I'll start with the uh, easy one or more of a, a, a classic point, I guess. So something we you know, often talk to people about in terms of getting their courses going and also designing a really effective course is don't um, overcomplicate things. <laughs> like don't try to throw everything in the kitchen sink uh, into your course and wind up overwhelming your participants in the process. And Diane's story really drove home what that looks like in practice. So she created a pilot. um, She had all these ideas and content from her book and her speaking, and she basically threw everything she could think of into the course. And sure enough, it was um, too much. But that's why you do the pilot, right? She found that out talking to people that they were getting stuck. They were confused about what to focus on. They weren't you know, always doing the assignments. And she took that um, feedback and and really simplified the course, slimmed it down, made it more minimalist in design. And, uh, you know, now she's seeing people really, really engaged, making progress, not getting confused. Um, And, you know, she realized too that that it's not like that content was lost. She could use it in other courses and other areas of her business. So it was a a win-win there. Yeah, and it's... You know, that drive towards simplicity, she she really, once she internalized it, you know, she really went, took it very far with the small snackable content, eight to 12 minutes long with the assignments to lead into action. And, you know, when you really have that focus, it, it really kind of, I guess, dials in your your attention to the the idea that, uh, so I have, a, I have a t-shirt with this Jack Dorsey quote that you have to make every detail perfect and you have to limit the number of details. And I feel like she saw that as well in the lesson about the consistency between the slides and the workbook, right? When even the image was a little bit different, people suddenly got confused. And I think that's a function of, you know, if you are an expert in a subject area, if you have that fluency, you can look at the information, kind of get a sense of, okay, this is core and this is peripheral or this is superfluous, right? You know, the image doesn't matter. It's illustrative. You know, they just swap this out. When you're just learning something, you you don't have the discernment to make that judgment yet. And so you're looking, you're like, everything must be significant. Otherwise it isn't, you know, otherwise it wouldn't be there. And so even those little discrepancies were really confusing. So, you know, dialing down the the breadth of what is covered and really dialing up 
the the specificity and precision of getting every one of those details right um, was also a really good takeaway there. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. I think that's uh, applicable to many, many you know, different types of courses. I mean, the other thing that stood out for me is just the importance of like sheer passion, right? I mean, you can tell how passionate Diane is about her work and and how it helps people. And that really comes through in how well she's serving her her clients. I mean, a, a lot of what we talk about is trying to like help people who are passionate not get stuck in like just giving away their ideas for free, you know, and actually build a business around their courses. But, you know, sometimes we may get kind of lost in, um, you know, thinking about business models and funnels and how do I market my course? Um, but the, like, the passion for, like, what you teach and, and who you're trying to serve is a fundamental part of creating something really great. Um, and, and, you know, I think her work really demonstrates how, how powerful that passion can be when you just pour it into um, the course you're creating. Yeah, it made it a lot of fun to just listen to her too, right? There's something contagious and infectious about passion. So something else that was really interesting to me was the interactive workbook with the homework. Even though, you know, she said it was a pain in the ass to put it together, it was a lot of work. But it really seems like it was the active ingredient that made the course so successful. So having these like small snackable bites of content, then it's like, now go do the work in your interactive workbook. Um, that was a very powerful mechanism for, I guess, creating a container for people to do that work and and really internalize what they're supposed to be internalizing. A common thread in multiple courses that we're looking at in Course Lab is that they provide forms of interaction that that get um, students to to do the work, right? But they in a way that's aligned with the particular focus of the course. Here, it was an interactive workbook, and and for other courses, it would be a different format, but sort of cracking the code for what's going to work in your specific course to get your students taking action is a seems to be a critical piece of the puzzle. Now, the debrief wouldn't be complete without talking about, this is your favorite area, which is the community discussion, which of course was facilitated by the Rizuku technology that she built her course on. Um, do you want to, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, we've seen that community is, is a component of, of multiple courses um, we reviewed. And I think it's it's a critical piece. I mean, sort of now more than ever where people have many different options for getting content online, right? Whether it's a you know free video on YouTube or a blog post or a low cost course on Udemy, like there's information of all kinds out there. So what actually sets your course apart? Well, some of it is the the design and the care you put into the course, but a lot of it is, are, does it feel like it's actually a, a social interaction, right? Does it feel like you're getting meaningful support from other people, um, that the instructor is, is present, you know, and, and not just this disembodied, you know, video voice. So figuring out how community slots into your course, I think is a question everyone should really think about if they're not already. Um, and then think about what do you need to do to actually make community engaging and meaningful for your specific group of students? It's not enough in most cases now to just slap together a discussion forum or put up a discussion prompt on Riziku and hope for the best. You really need to think about what are the, the needs and questions of people coming into your course? What are they looking for in terms of community? What are the areas where they might get stuck and they're going to want to have that support from their peers and from you? And then try to, to put in prompts that are going to lead to that community interaction being more meaningful. Yeah, and it's so worth the effort to do that because I think what we also saw from Diane's example in, in her course is that once you get over a certain threshold, it's a flywheel that starts to turn more easily and sometimes with its own momentum, right? That moment, as she was describing, when you know, a question is posted and before she can even get to it, it is answered by someone else in the community. That's a, that's a very special moment. Yeah. I love it. I think that's it on the, the debrief for me. Yeah. That's all I got too. So do you want to read us out? Let's do it. 
Course Lab is a Mirror CFM original production. Thank you for listening to Course Lab. I'm Abe Crystal from Rizuku, and my co-host is Danny Eaney. This episode of Course Lab was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Nisi Lance and Jeff Govertson assembled the episode. Danny Eaney is our executive producer. Big thanks to Diane Southard for taking the time to tell us about her course. You can find out more about her at yourdnaguide.com. That's yourdnaguide.com. Don't forget to tune into Miracy's new podcast, Making It. In each episode, a successful entrepreneur will share what making it means to them and what they've learned along the way. Make sure you don't miss the really great episodes coming up on this season of Course Lab. So subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you like the show, please leave us a starred review. It's the best way to help us get these ideas to more people. Thank you. We'll see you next time.